at the uh, Andrews Community Forest in the town of Richmond, and we're here to look at wildlife, um, what they're doing this time of year. It's um, Valentine's Day, uh, it's just snowed, and we're excited to see what's going on out in these woods. I'm here with Jens Hawkins Hilke and Sophie Mazawita. Jens, what hat are you wearing today? <laughs> um. I'm, uh, I'm a conservation planner with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and, and I really, uh, I really want to talk about this area from, from the air and, and get this landscape context here uh, and, and talk about that bigger picture as we, as we experience things on the ground. Perfect. And Sophie, you've been watching what animals are up to out in the woods this time of year and seeing lots of flirting going on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm a, I'm a wildlife tracking uh, educator and consultant. And yeah, this is the season of uh, some pair bonding, some courtship for a lot of the wild animals who are out here. And it's yeah, kind of convenient that it coincides with Valentine's Day. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll keep our eyes on the ground and also think about where we are from the air. And I'm going to talk a little bit about wildlife through time on the Vermont landscape. But let's get started. We'll head this way. So Jens, a lot of your work with wildlife is considering how they have to cross roads or find a way around them somehow. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Sophie just found some uh, raccoon tracks right here uh, and they actually go right down through a culvert uh, under Route 2. And so for me, stories like this really show how even a, a big chunk of woods like the Andrews Community Forest isn't an island. It's connected to a, a much larger uh, set of, of forests and, and that invariably for wildlife means going under or over roads. Wow, and, and there's a really interesting project that's going on just, uh, just not a far bit down the road from here. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so just east of here on the Bolton Waterbury town line uh, is a brook that we call Sharkyville Brook that goes under uh, Route 2 and I-89. It's a really small culvert. I think it's about five feet wide and almost 400 feet long. And so for wildlife, it's a tiny little pinhole of light at the end. We've been uh, doing trail cameras there for, gosh, probably 10 years now and have a lot of photos of animals moving parallel to the highway. And so we've documented those, those tracks and those, those pictures over time. Uh, and we're just successful in getting a federal highway, uh, federal highway award to um, appropriately size that culvert. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So we'll replace it with a 100 foot span bridge. And, yeah. and that's really reconnecting the, the central Green Mountains to the northern Green Mountains. It's just an incredible opportunity. So glad to hear that. So I just love a brush pile like this. I feel like as a wildlife tracker or naturalist, I have a different aesthetic than most people walking through the woods because I see this, it looks like a huge mess. And I just want to go looking for mouse trails and squirrels and just all the activity of small mammals that I know is happening underneath all of this downed woody debris. And so here I am, I'm, I'm not actually seeing any trails right now because this snow just fell, but by tomorrow morning, I'm expecting there to be mazes of mouse trails and all kinds of movement happening under here and potentially signs of other animals that are hunting for what's underneath. So would that be owls and foxes? And I would bobcats? think owls, potentially foxes. Yeah, I, I, what, I once talked to a landowner who had a big brush pile in their backyard that they had just been piling up over the months trying to clean up the woods, so to speak. And uh, it was a regular perch of hawks and owls and they would yeah. see the prints in the snow and see all that hunting activity. And then, of course, one day they finally did the final cleanup and they removed that <gasps> from their woods, thinking that they were doing a good, a good job of removing the debris. And of course, no more hawks, no more owls coming oh. and hunting that pile. I guess the only last thing I want to reflect on is this is one of the values of these town forests is that you have them over a length of time and they're conserved so that these kinds of brush piles can grow up in the understory. You have this woody debris. Uh, that's so valuable, both for wildlife, but also for carbon in the soils and, you know, soil formation and yeah, other things. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and you can see this one is actively growing, right? There's recently downed branches here. Yeah, the needles are still on that yeah. white pine, so things came down. Yeah.
So Jens, I'm trying to wrap my mind around here in Andrews Community Forest, just where we are in the broader Vermont landscape and just in the broader landscape of conservation in Vermont. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. You know, I was at this meeting in Jay and a landowner, when I was done talking, the landowner said, oh, so you mean a cosmic zoom? <laughs> you start at the parcel, then you zoom way out and get a bigger ecological context, and then you zoom back in. I think that's exactly uh, the kind of thing you're asking here, is like, how does this sit? So, you know, Andrews Community Forest is, is 400 plus acres, uh, but it sits in a larger forest block uh, of about 6,500 acres. So a forest block, uh, I'm not talking about property boundaries, I'm talking about cover. Yeah. Right. So any sort of natural cover, it's surrounded by roads, development and agriculture. And so that 6000 acre block is itself in between the, the, the spine of the greens and, and down into the Champlain Valley. And so there's this potential for connection because there's exponentially more life, uh, more species mm. at lower elevation than at higher elevation. Mm. So here in this Chittenden Uplands, uh, even that 6,500 acre block plays a really outsized role, both in connecting from the, the high elevation to the low elevation and also in terms of, of where it sits in, in Richmond. So it's it's really an interesting an interesting place as we think about that that cosmic zoom. And you do that a lot in the work that you do. You try to think about things like I remember when I first started working in conservation. Uh, it was these core parcels. It's almost like random acts of conservation. Yeah. Let's save this place. And the conversations really evolved to thinking about connections and how. It, you know, populations need to disperse in order to be genetically healthy. There are all kinds of reasons animals need to move around the landscape to find mates and mates and move through the seasons. And so you, you wrestle with all of that kind yeah. of at a Vermont wide scale. Yeah, I think conservation has really moved from islands of habitat in a sea of development to really thinking about, well, how do we have a, how, how do we have a sea of, of habitat with islands of development? Wow. Uh, and so what's that larger picture look like? But landscape scale conservation, I think is increasingly important because mm -hmm. the pattern of how forests connect to one another yes. is more important now than ever with yes. increasing sprawl development in Vermont, that, that larger landscape pattern really matters. Yes, yeah, so that sounds like such important work that you're doing. I just want to say thank you for doing it. Let's go find, let's go find Sophie. So Sophie, I know you've been doing this long enough and intensely enough that you could look at this sort of faded out trail and know that you have a hind foot and a front foot and and but it really helps me to have you put the footprints down there where I can see it. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I find it helpful for visualizing too, right? But yeah, I'm looking at the way that this animal was moving because I really don't have details of the footprints here and then the context of the trail to understand who might have been moving here. Typically in raccoon trails, we're used to seeing a larger hind foot showing up next to a smaller front foot in this extended walk that they have. But as snow conditions get deeper, or in this case, as this raccoons may be picking up speed as they move downhill, they end up in this uh, extended direct register walk where actually the hind feet are ending up covering up where the front feet have landed. And that can look a lot like a bobcat trail. You might confuse it for coyote or fox even. Uh, so it's, it's the full context though and the full story and usually following the trail and finding more evidence that can help reveal who it is. Well, and you did follow it and you found that it, this animal goes, this raccoon goes right up into that tree. So yeah. let's go see what was going on down there. Yeah, sounds good. Sophie, I think these big cavity trees are so cool. I'm, I'm seeing how the tree is, is growing around the cavity a little bit. What, what else are you seeing here? Yeah, well, it, it actually looks like there may be some woodpecker, like bill strike marks where probably a pileated has been foraging and carpenter ants coming into here and, and just looking at the big space. I was, I was looking to see if there was enough of a cavity that has a roof on it that could actually be serving as a shelter for wildlife or because this big branch has fallen and cracked off if it's now a little too exposed. Uh, but I was drawn up to this ridgeline in the first place, right, just because there is this big row of dominant trees up here that can be so significant for wildlife. Yeah, these giant red oaks, really. I mean, these are as big as they get. 
in terms of girth, aren't they? They're just really nice looking trees mm -hmm. and reaching the end of their lifespan. Yeah, these also end up serving as communication posts for animals. So if you follow me around to the other side of the tree, yeah, we'll take us. a look. So take a look right in here. Oh yeah. You might notice there's a bit of a different color to the bark. I do see that. And this is a pretty subtle example of, of what I call a squirrel stripe or a gray squirrel scent marking post. You can see little parallel bite marks. These are the incisor marks of probably more than one individual gray squirrel. It's often the males that mark, but all the different squirrels will come and smell, pick up on scent messages from these bite marks and then the cheek rubbing that the squirrels do at this location. Yeah, I've seen these that seem like they're so well developed that there might be generations of squirrels, you know, yeah, leaving absolutely. The marks in the same place. It's just sort of wild to think about just squirrel after squirrel after squirrel chewing on this tree to leave a message. Yeah, and you, you often see it. This is a pretty textbook location, right? It's on the side of the tree that's protected from the dominant wind that's coming out of the west. Uh, it's at the base of the tree. So usually if a tree has a lean to it at all, it's going to be under that protected side or it's underneath the first branch. So if we actually look, and, and usually on the, the biggest trees in an area, so if we actually zoom out, we might be able to spot more of these. And there's actually one right behind us as well. Oh, wow. Up that next example. Oh, that's so cool. And do you think they're hidden from the wind to protect the scent part of it? Yeah, the exactly. They want it to hold the the, the marking for longer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've, I've even seen a squirrel stripe in somebody's backyard in Burlington that when it rains, it's just, it's tucked under a first branch so that when it rains, you can see that the whole tree gets wet except for underneath wow. that one branch. <laughs> that is so cool. So Sophie, I just put my hand here and realized that I, I think I'm seeing something in terms of potential bear sign. Yeah, this looks like a bite mark from a bear that was coming and marking on this tree. And am I right that they like they stand up and they claw the in this case post yeah, like and, then they, and then they <laughs> and then they they just turn over their shoulder and take a hunk out of the tree or the post. Yeah. yeah. You can sometimes even like stick a little stick in, right? So oh yeah. Probably oh. the lower incisor yeah. dug in. Although I noticed this one's tilted a little bit downwards. It's gonna be harder to get a piece into the air. Right oh. There. There's the bear teeth. Yeah, There's the bear awesome. teeth coming together on this post. Yeah. So it's not an accident we're standing here, right? Right. I mean, you know, the, these sorts of power lines, while it, it's not great habitat for bear, uh, they're not living here, but it's certainly a, a good connector uh, for, for moving from, from one forested area to the next. Uh, and so I, we regularly see bears mark up these uh, sorts of power line poles and telephone poles and uh, they're, it's really obvious sign. Yeah, I think they're particularly attracted too to just how uh, scented they are. Like they want to be marking areas where their scent's going to carry too. So you see this on these kinds of poles. Red pine trees are a favorite because of how yes. aromatic they are. So yeah, and yeah. I, I guess they're also often on fir and paper birch. Mm -hmm. So maybe the birch is because they're so visible. Yeah. But the red pine, I, I've seen them went down in the Salisbury area, just chewed up by bear. Like just, it seemed like over and over again, they were biting the same trees. Yeah. So what are the bears doing this time of year? They're under, they're hibernating? Hibernating, Mostly. I mean, bears aren't true like deep hibernators in the sense, you know, it's not like clockwork, uh, you know, maybe more like a groundhog or a woodchuck where they just, you know, go in and then come out months later. They're responsive to conditions, right? So bears will hibernate when the calories that they're bringing in uh, aren't making up the calories going out. So in colder temperatures, stormier conditions, when there's not much mass, you know, maybe acorns or beech nuts left over, they tend to hibernate. And on a cold winter, that could mean, you know, straight through for months. But a winter like this, where you've had lots of freeze thaw cycles, I would be unsurprised to find bear tracks, uh, you know, this week even, you know, uh -huh. early February, mid-February. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I, mean, I was just wondering about their mating season like when are they trying to find each other yeah finding each other in the summer like late june uh into july even would be the peak of, of bear season so you can in the spring see an uptick in this kind of marking behavior uh you know looking around these kinds of areas wetland edges often get marked up anywhere that bears are, are congregating actually and finding food and you know this may not look like typical bear habitat here right like out in the middle of the open but i do wonder about the the foods that they might be able to find here what kind of vegetation out of the hundred berries of types or of, yeah vegetation yeah. berries they might be eating here um so yeah. their valentine's day would be more mid-june to yeah. <laughs> june, valentine's june 14th day. But this is the time of year that 
bears are giving birth right right in their dens yeah uh, which yeah. is pretty amazing. So yeah, around the turn of February or, or through this month, there'll be little cubs tucked away. So again, you know, we think about a bear fast asleep as they hibernate, but it's really more like uh, taking a nap and kind of being semi-aware, right? As you're giving birth to cubs and starting to nurse them. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and if you come up on a bear den uh, right now, you know, if you were to find one at the base of a tree or underneath some brush pile or something yeah. like that, that bear would probably be quite alert, right? It would take them a while to get up and out of their den if they felt compelled. But, uh, but they'll be aware of you. They'll, wow. you know, could be looking out or even hearing you, smelling you, for sure. Well, and I, I think back, the UVM Field Naturalist did an early report on this Andrews Community Forest, just thinking about wildlife and what a hot spot it is for wildlife. And one of them ran into a bear in the middle of summer out here, you know, just looked up a ridge and there it was. And I think it was eating beech drops. Maybe, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, there was an association with that story to beach drop. Maybe she was looking at beach drops, but, uh, <laughs> but they eat a wide range of things, animal, vegetable, uh, yeah, different kinds. Yeah, true, yeah. true omnivores, you know, they, they're classified as a carnivore, right? Based on their, their teeth, their, uh, their ability to consume meat. But, you know, diet wise, yeah, most of their diet is plant food. So as these snows melt away, they'll be heading towards the first areas, maybe around wetland edges or seeps where the first fresh green up of maybe sedges is occurring or you know grass-like uh, plants and, and looking for carrion maybe any deer that didn't make it through the winter wow. uh, finding their way often by smell to that and then just progressing with the wave of plant <coughs> foods that come from there all the way through to the beech nuts and acorns in the fall when they do their big uh, period of hyperphagia right of <sighs> feasting before they go into den this and of course those those food sources are are, are, are rarely in the same exact forest uh, and so that quest for different food sources at different times of year takes them moving between different forest blocks and and I find that really interesting you know the the beach uh, the beach in the in the the beech nuts in the fall mm -hmm. up on the ridge or the berries on the power line cuts in the summer you know different food sources at different times of year. and often the kind of grasses that are that come out in the seats that are the warmest yeah. You know, early in the spring, yeah. I see signs of bears in those areas. Yeah. There's one place um, up at uh, in, in near Bog in Morrisville, where I've seen too that they've. It's just a seepy, wet forest, but they've made a whole bear wallow. Have you ever seen there? It's like the the moss is all sort of pushed aside, and you can see where they've scratched. A, a tree that's hanging over it, and you can just tell they go there to cool off yeah. you know they just need a variety of things through different seasons and they're out there looking for it huh yeah. your story though about them coming out or, or being calorie kind of regulated you know how they're very they're trying to get through the winter <laughs> kind of did make me think of early vermonters and there are records that people slept a lot you know in the winter and just ate potatoes out of their you know root cellars and just got by you know yeah. so we may have kind of been attuned to those seasons more back then as well right yeah it's interesting to think about i, I think a lot of people relate to bears you know that, yeah, we, yeah we see some similarities in their habits and ours yeah even just in the sense that they can kind of plant themselves on their hind feet, right? And come and give a good back rub or smell <laughs> like an object like this. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and there's some evidence there was a dig pretty close to here over in Jonesville. And they excavated a bunch of hearths from... So the, the Abenaki, um, at the time of contact, were, were doing some... What people now are kind of calling more gardening than farming. It was sort of small-scale agriculture down the Intervale. Then they'd come up the Wooster River in canoes and hunt. So the interesting thing was they found all these bone fragments, including fragments of bare bones around the hearse, but they found no skulls or any evidence of jaws or anything. So there's some evidence that they were taking the, he the heads with them back to the village for some other purpose, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. But this reverence yeah. for black bears, I think, shows up across cultures in different ways. I know I feel reverence when I see one. <laughs> That was a good find. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for telling yeah. a bear story. Yeah. I've got the bear story. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> yes, there you go. Well, <laughs> you guys knew where, knew where to look. Or know. So this is quite a find, Sophie. Yeah. It's I, looking like basswood, and do you see how it just strips right off? Yeah, yeah. look at that. It's that really... Uh, yeah, papery inner bark yeah. that's trailing down here. I don't know about you, but when I first saw this tree from a distance, I thought I might be looking at a buck rub, like where a deer had rubbed forehead and antlers against a tree. And then it struck me that it was too high up. And if you continue looking up, it goes all the way 
up to almost the very top of this small tree. So you revised your theory. What, what do you think we're seeing here? Exactly. I think this is nesting material being gathered by squirrels. And uh, I can just imagine how papery and insulative if you gather enough of this, right? Yeah. That you can make yourself a pretty nice nest. Yeah. And what I love with this inner bark of basswood is making cordage. Have you ever? Yeah, it makes really that. good cordage it as does. well. It does. It's just so fun to do that. It's so relaxing. Maybe we'll do that when we eat lunch here in a minute. <laughs> yeah, this sounds good. You can even see uh, some of the claw marks oh, from the yeah, squirrels yeah. that have come in here. And, and I say squirrels, but I imagine there could be several different rodent species, including squirrel species, that might be making use of this material here. So you were talking about how uh, we looked at the giant big snags and how useful they are for shelter and other things in, in wild forests. Um, and also these small dead trees. So it really seems like there's a, a theme today. We've been noticing the importance both of big dead trees on the landscape, right, as denning cavities, and then also the importance of smaller standing dead trees like this one as a source of nesting material, and then uh, the ongoing importance once they fall to the ground. Hey, take a look at this. Oh, look what he found. This is classic porcupine sign, and I think this is a mountain maple, but you can really see the, the chatter marks from the teeth. And then as you zoom up, you can get a sense of how they just systematically took pieces of bark off all the way up. Um, and maples, beech, hemlock are all favorite foods. Super cool. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, that must be fun. You have to do multiple takes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of takes. Uh -oh. Oh. oh, hey, there's somebody else out here. Hey, kid. Hey, Oh, wow. Hi. Hey, I am Amazing. delighted to see you because we've been just following our nose out here, but you can actually take us places. Oh, well, <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah. You know, I've been around the ledge and there's more ledge up there. So are you out looking for bobcat? Well, I have been. I haven't yeah. been too successful at the moment, but uh, well, yeah. Just all the fresh snow. Um, I remember being out here with you, though, and, once looking for bobcat. And, and do you remember that story? I certainly do. We found tracks where there was blood. Blood in the in paw. In the track. Right. And so we knew every time we crossed that same bobcat that it was the same one. Yes. Because we could tell from the bleeding. Yes. And then you went back and found what? Well, I found, I backtracked. Right? We had initially tracked the bobcat for a very short distance, found where it ate its prey, but didn't find the the complete story. So the next day I did go back and I backtracked and I found the bobcat prior to where its paw started to bleed and it actually had gone, up. it met up with a rabbit right in its tracks, Took must have taken the rabbit, went in the, the downed trees and, and brush and came out with a bloody paw at that point. And so and then we we got the whole story at That's, that point. I was so impressed with you. It was really fun yeah. the next day doing that. Yeah. So I was even trying to think, am I going to find where we were to begin with? And but we, we were out with the Vermont Master Naturalist. Yes, we were. That was we, so we fun were. that winter. It was really fun. It just really yeah. made me appreciate the abundance of bobcat out here. Yes. Because you... Yes. Took us here looking for them and we right and away we, started we to found it right away. Yeah. Right. It was really was nice so, to do that. Yeah. It was a lovely time. Right. And um, you know, I've noticed today I haven't found as many tracks out of course it's a first snow, um, fresh snow and sometimes you don't find them right trying tracks right off. But um one of the things I did find here and oh. buck rub right here. <laughs> oh yeah. Um wow. and um it looks to be on um, mountain maple. And they basically take their antlers and just rub up and down against this. And um, yeah, I'm just looking to see if there's any more rub areas in the in this area. Um, but there's a lot of browsing that's gone on here at the top. Yeah, yeah I and see that. And you'll find right yeah. at the top there. And so does this rubbing happen? I know they have scent glands right at the base yes. of their antlers. So he's yes. marking. He's marking. But do they also do this to get the velvet off when the uh, antlers are new? Like, yes, if the antlers are new uh, and they're trying to remove the velvet, they will do that. Sometimes the velvet's hanging in the tree. Oh. I've never seen that, but... I'd love um, to see that. Yeah, I would too. I think it would be really cool to see that. One thing I'm always struck with about antlers is you go walking in the woods and you hardly ever find them. I mean, I, okay, I once in my lifetime in Vermont found a moose antler hardly ever deer and when i did they're often chewed to bits they're usually yeah they're usually chewed up and because I think they, 
they they disintegrate pretty easily. Yeah, and the rodents are after the yeah. calcium, so they'll just eat them, yeah. you know, so quickly. Yeah. It's just kind of amazing how you feel that cycle going on with antlers, because right. you think, why right. aren't they everywhere? There's so many deer. Why don't it's I trip true. over It's true, we should see them everywhere, <laughs> and especially moose, moose antlers. Yeah, they're, they're really big. large. And yeah. They're really hard to find. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So... Well, thank you for finding that for yeah. us. So we're off to a good start with you. Do you well, want to take us further? Um, yeah, might... I mean, if you guys want to see this ledge up yeah, here, which I think is pretty significant um, in this area. And, you know, one thing I like about this whole area is it's a very rugged landscape. Mm -hmm. And I think bobcats really are, it's a prime habitat for bobcat and other wildlife, of course. But I think bobcats especially because it's broken up ledge. It creates a, a, an area for them for, for movement uh -huh. and, and an area for them to be secure because mostly people aren't up in these higher elevations or on ledges. And I think it's really important not to be on these ledges, especially now during mating season. This is their time to, to really be able to have successful um, kittens and yes. I think it's important that we you know stay away from these areas and also not just seasonal but you know this is their their way for for um, getting around yeah. and um, you know marking their their territory and um, it's their you know the ledges are, are very important for successful bobcat. So two things I think about as you're telling the story is we did see where the bobcat with the cut foot yes. sat down on a ledge yes. long enough to melt the snow underneath it and we could see where it had licked the foot. That's right. You know, he was just feeling yes. safe, yes. you know, and that it could stop and tend to its injury and, you right. know, hang out on these rocky spots. And yeah, then, and I think that's important. I mean, they need to be secure and have... Um, uh, concealment and yeah and I do want to add that we did choose February over March I would because did. we were pretty sure the kits would not be in the dens yet yes so we're trying to be respectful as well be respectful. in our time yes yes our crew yes we're out right here. and another thing to note up here this dry oak forest up here which I, I we've seen a lot of deer up in through the dry oak uh, forest I've seen some uh, Deer beds up up here. All last winter was lots of deer beds up in here, and that was fun to, to watch. Well, let's go see what at. let's go see what yeah, we let's see, see next. what we can All see right. up here. So you you two look like you found something. What are you looking well, at? I, I, well, I, I think we have. I think we decided that they were bobcat tracks. Yeah, and, and we didn't plant these, right? This this is a, <laughs> looks like a small, so probably a female bobcat that moved through this area last night or in the early hours of this morning. I'm noticing that we're not seeing a lot of detail in the tracks and this fluffy snow, but it's it's just been snowed into a little bit. So just before the snow ended this morning. Wow. And I think, you know, these are definitely direct register and the stride is, is very bobcat-like and and the area we're in is where we would expect to see bobcats. So, so direct so, register gracefully putting their back, back foot, foot into their where into the, foot the foot. front foot. Yeah, where the track yeah. is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's tough tracking in these conditions. And just meaning midday sun, right? It's it's a little hard to see this trail right now. But we're looking at like I'm gesturing at the space between three tracks, which corresponds roughly to the hip to shoulder length or yeah oh, body yeah. length of that animal so I can yeah. kind of I can, I, I can imagine the bobcat right standing mm -hmm. in that spot and, and you know they could have even stopped on on three feet and you know paused at that location sometimes we'll see a different pattern in the trail when that happens yeah um even though this is a Snowden trail we we both came up pretty confident that we're looking at that, bobcat right clearly right it's just the stride and the straightness of the track so we thought their kit knew and brought us here. Predictably, this is good bobcat habitat. What's the range of places that you see them, Sophie? What else do you see mm. bobcat? Because yeah, I know well, they're adaptable. And, and I certainly think of these ridges as preferred uh, denning habitat, you know, if, if not absolutely necessary, that they need these more protected places. But, uh, but we'll see bobcats uh, hunting wetlands and mm -hmm. wetland edges for sure, moving along stream corridors. Uh, in all manner of forested areas, 
and then we can also see them in agricultural fields and and uh, and even urban suburban fringe areas and typically in those areas they're in brushy dense cover mm -hmm. sometimes coming out and spotted in the open but we often see them preferring say a hedgerow that cuts through mm -hmm. an open field or something like that so areas of dense cover and and they're hunters that uh, that stalk, that sit out and wait for prey. So, you know, picture even what your house cat does when they come out the back door of your house and they're sitting and surveying the landscape, right? A, a bobcat is also going to be a visual hunter that's looking to find areas of cover uh, where there's prey moving through, whether that's cottontail rabbits, uh, squirrels, which they may even chase up trees. So it's, it's really a matter of where the food is, but also needing cover for their style of hunting. You know, needing to, to sneak up and approach. Right. Oh, yeah. Well done. Yeah. And, and we even see this trail. We were yes. just taking a look. So up you along followed the trail. it a little further because I saw you up higher. Do you want to show us what you found up there? Yeah, let's go further. Yeah. 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 All right. So this is where you think it came up the hill and turned around and headed back down, huh? Yeah. That's the, a the nice trail ends here. set of prints. That's awesome. Yeah, there's our clearest print of the day. So here we are in the continuation of our bobcat trail and you know one thing I love about tracking is that you really get to know the habits and preferences of different species. As I was coming along the slope here, I knew to look on this log even before I knew where the trail was. You know, like we, we were trying to like regain the bobcat trail and uh, you know, I predicted that they might want to walk on a log like this and here they are and we have this track going all the way up. Yeah, and Sophie's right. I mean, if you, like you said, if we lose a bobcat track, know to go to a log and you'll find more, oh, the bobcat track. You will pick up a bobcat track. And this is great. You know, you can see right where the bobcat has walked in each step here. The snow is melted away and it just goes all the way up the, lo up the log. And it's very cool and it, it's uh, so typical of bobcat to walk up the logs like this. Mm -hmm. I can just imagine that slinky way that, that bobcats in particular seem to have of moving their feet in, very in such a straight, like they have a very narrow walk, right? The way that they place their feet and it's almost like walking a tightrope the way that she would have come up this log. Right. Yep. Yeah. Makes me think of other animals, right? Bobcats aren't the only animals that we see walking on, on logs like this. Yeah. I mean, I guess we see uh, um, raccoons maybe and maybe even uh, porcupine. On a log? I'm not sure about porcupine. Yeah, I, I think about gray fox in yep. particular, actually, and, and red fox to some degree, but gray fox in particular. Yep. Um, fishers. Fisher. Definitely, definitely making use of logs as well, right. and sometimes hopping up quite high onto right. them. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and then Bobca, any of the felines, really. Yeah, um, yeah, just so cool to picture this movement, right? And that's the other thing in, in finding this track. You know, we're not just looking at the track, it really gives you that. It's almost like watching a movie of the animal in your mind, right. right? Just putting together that story. And the balance she must, she really has to be able to watch. This is a skinny log and she's staying on it all the way up. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. A spot like this, uh, you know, logs over water are one spot that I always think to look. And yeah. if I'm looking to place a game camera out on the landscape, I, I often want to find an area that's really funneling movement. And, right. um, and I really do see a log like this over a snowy landscape acting like a bit of a natural bridge too, just, just like a log over water. So uh, yeah, definitely something to keep your eyes up for when you're out tracking. Definitely. definitely. So there's some really cool uh, shots of a couple of tracks here in particular. This bobcat actually brought their claws out for extra traction as they walked up this log, right? We don't normally think about seeing claws in feline tracks, but they, they do have them. Uh, they're protractile, so they can bring them out in situations like this. And so in this case, just wanting a little bit of extra grip as the bobcat moves up this narrow snowy log. So you can see claw pricks right in here, and you can see them in the next couple of tracks as well usually very thin sharp claws that you you see the pricks quite a bit ahead of the toes. So Sophie we're following that bobcat and we end up in this uh, dry oak forest up here on this ridge line yeah. and just lots to talk about in terms of this is, is habitat. There's of course a mix of natural communities out here including this one and this one has a lot of white oak in it which I can see even this white oak acorn cap was chewed, like probably by a porcupine. I've seen this before. 
mm. where they eat the white oak acorns. They're very, white oak acorns are very popular. They're much sweeter than the red oak. Yeah, super popular. You know. They're lower in tannins, right? So yes. Yeah, so humans all, and all manner of wildlife tend to prefer them. So that, that really stood out when I saw these from a distance, right? Well, yeah. And look at, do you see the bite in that? Yeah. I mean, I've seen porcupine do it before. They just leave, like, they just like chomp it down. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Nice. And I, I imagine an oak knoll like this being really attractive to so many different species, right? When those acorns are ripe, we're thinking porcupines, we're thinking squirrels, we're thinking deer, turkeys, bear, mice, squirrels, exactly. chipmunks. Yeah, more on squirrels. and on. More squirrels. Yeah, I think I said squirrels at least twice, right? right? More squirrels. No, it's true because they are uh, one of the things we most encounter out here for sure. Yeah. Um, and so as we were saying, they're, they're more tasty than the red. They also germinate the year that they hit the ground. So they're, right. they're, they don't store well. Right. Uh, squirrels have learned to store them by killing the root so they don't germinate and then caching them. But, but they're, more commonly, they'll eat the, the white oak acorns and um, cache the red oak acorns, store them for later. So, you know, it's just, it's just the adaptability of animals is just phenomenal. And I saw you as we were walking up, starting to finger, starting to touch some <laughs> well, of these, you know, put your hands on yeah, some of these tiny oaks that are having. Exactly. You know, th this isn't a, a normal growth pattern for them, although it's, it's another sign of, of food, of browse, right? So these, these oaks have probably been munched on repeatedly by deer, uh, by some ungulate. I see the rough cuts and basically where that growing tip gets killed by being eaten. Uh, the side branches then take over and so it's uh you get these bonsai looking yeah. shrubs shrub oaks yeah, really. and it, and it but, almost yeah. looks like art and of course yeah. we'll, we'll hope that some of them will uh will be able to grow up to a bigger size yeah. to regenerate and replace and it seems like that's oaks. true in here like we have some sort of sapling size oaks growing yeah here. yeah it's nice to see actually that we've yeah gotten some <laughs> that have gotten past this stage and are now out of the reach right of hungry deer Alicia, I, I gotta confess, I think hemlock is my favorite tree. Mm. And I mean, they get, they'll get 400 years old. They're these massive, massive, and just something about the light and the feel, it just, they, they feel so ancient to me. And it just sort of takes me on this, this journey. I, I agree that they're a beautiful tree. And I also just like the energy that you get from standing in among them. And your story about time, actually, that is what I wanted to talk about next, is, uh, you know, in, in the Vermont Master Naturalist Program, and you're all familiar with that, um, we tell these chapters of the story of Vermont. You know, so we start with the oldest story, which is the bedrock formation in an ancient ocean, come up through the Ice Age, which is the event that laid down most of the parent material for our soil, so the sands and the clays and the tills that we are living in and among. Yeah, um, we've seen plenty of glacial erratics here today. <laughs> exactly, right? lots yeah. of big boulders left by the glaciers. Mm -hmm. So beautiful landscape for that. Then we come up into uh, the after the ice, the post-glacial era, and I have a handout that uh, our, my artist uh, Lorna Delentes made. She does a beautiful job and. Uh, I just want to um, show you sort of an expansion of that time after the glaciers retreated from Vermont. It's amazing how much went on with the large mammals. You know, that we started out with mammoths and mastodons. In fact, once, I think it was a mammoth, the tooth that was unearthed here in Richmond. Yeah. So, you know, signs of these early, early animals, um, musk oxen, caribou. So we went from like a tundra environment um, through a uh, boreal forest into more of a woodland period and even a warmer forest than we have today for a while that had a lot of oaks and then into the, the animals that we're familiar with including the very recently arrived coyote that came from out west really to fill in the niche that, uh, the niche that wolves used to fill. Um, so we've had a lot of change in our wildlife landscape What's kind of amazing to me about this story too, and if you if we if we spread out this era after Europeans arrived, the up and down of different species is just wild. You know, we some of them were extirpated, some of them then were reintroduced, and so that's a whole nother timeline. Yeah. But it just a lot has happened with the large mammals in our Vermont landscape. What's also striking to me is that uh, 
ancestral Abenaki, the earliest people arrived right following the glacier north. So people arrived in Vermont very, very early in this whole evolutionary story of yeah, probably wildlife. Probably ex experiencing this valley as salt exactly. water even. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, there are uh, in, in camp, there are hearths that they found in Williston that were where the old edge of the Champlain Sea was. Yeah. And so we had whales out here, you know, the beluga whale and named Char Charlotte, Charlotte. And uh, we had seals in Burlington until, you know, the late 1800s. So it's just wild yeah. what's gone on out here. Um, you know, as we talk about plants and you look at pollen grains, some of the, the communities like Hemlock and Beech uh, that we think of as, as being closer together, you know, historically we're, we're very far apart and have only recently come together. That's so interesting. Uh, and so, you know, the whole, our whole sense of what a natural community is really depends on the time scale. And they do change. And we're expecting them with climate change, you know, as Vermont warms, for those to rearrange themselves as well. Yeah, I, I think we'll need to rename some of our natural communities, you know, as the more in terms of function than in terms of the species that are present. That makes a lot of sense. But places that host a variety of natural communities now, we assume will continue to host them into the future. We're yeah. really looking at what we think of as the stage, you know, what are things growing on, and how do you uh, keep those areas conserved and healthy? Um, so that we have a future. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting to me because uh, I, I work a lot with Vermont conservation design. And so we're trying to prioritize the most important places, not only for biological diversity today, but into the future. And part of how we look into the future is through that physical landscape diversity that yes. you're talking about. Yeah. So that stage, you know, the, the stage is home to biological diversity today and will be into the future, even as the species change. Exactly. And you want a variety of those at different elevations, you know, with different bedrock types and, you know, things that will capture the whole biodiversity that, that's possible in an evolving landscape. Yeah. with climate pressures. Yeah. yeah, and and this area, the Andrews Community Forest, does show up in Vermont conservation design, uh, partially as a highest priority because of this the physical landscape diversity. And so some of the natural communities that we've seen here today, that's not an accident. It's because of the, the, the interesting, you know, the schists and the phyllites, the interesting bedrock with the mix of soils on top, that those unique characteristics allow for these unique natural communities that we've seen today. Well, and there, because of its steep there's a pretty big change in elevation from I think 400 feet to 1200 feet all in this 400 acres so you know not only because of that do we have these ravines these steeply weathered um, features in the landscape partly because of that uh, all the water yeah. that travels over this yeah. landscape at different speeds and different seasons and in snow <laughs> but yeah there's a lot going on out here yeah. so oh, really um, fun. we're gonna head to a ravine but i also want to talk to you more about vermont conservation design is this a good moment to sure talk about that tell, yeah. tell us more what do people want to know about using this tool so, biofinder yeah so biofinder is the website uh, vermont conservation design is the, the prioritization and it tells us from a state wide perspective the most important lands and waters to maintain for ecological function into the future. So it's a statewide prioritization uh, and you know it's, it's very difficult to compare places on the top of Mount Mansfield with the bottom of the Champlain Valley. So that, that statewide prioritization is is accurate, but you know, should be, we should understand that that it is that that at that statewide scale. But it really focuses on you know, in terms of Andrews Community Forest, uh, where there's interior forest or connectivity, and we've talked about some of those themes today. And of course, the the surface water network, uh, the riparian areas, and then into community and species scale components, many of which we've talked about, uh, things like wetlands and vernal pools and and, and even wildlife road crossings. So it's a multi-scaled prioritization of, of, of the landscape. What I love about it is, you know, it, it, I, I used it to, to do a little homework on, on Andrews Community yeah, Forest before me. I arrived. Uh, just to give me a sense, like, okay, what might I look out for? 
Uh, it's not going to replace field work and, and what we experience on the ground, but it does give you a sense of context. So coming into this hike, I thought, okay, let's look at the bedrock. Okay, phyll phyllites, sh schists and phyllites. Okay, let's look at the surficial geology. And that, that layer cake that's at, really at the heart of the, the, the Master Naturalist program, uh, you know, you can really do that uh, in, in, in the BioFinder website and get this a sense cool. of, of those, those components. And then when you see them on the ground, you can connect that piece mm -hmm. uh, to the, that much larger context. Again, that cosmic zoom, right? Yeah, that is <laughs> awesome. And I have to tell you, I did the same thing. <laughs> so where do people find this? Like, where would you go? Yeah, just Google BioFinder. That's Biofinder. the easiest way to Take find you in. it. And then there are layers, and yep. you can click on geology, yep. you can click on natural communities, yeah. other things. Yeah. So one thing with that cosmic zoom story that, you know, statewide conservation, we still, it's still incumbent locally for people to have to sort out what to do with their natural areas. And this is a big ask for people, mostly volunteers, yeah. who are trying to decide how can we um, navigate human use, wildlife, natural communities, connectivity, riparian zones. Any thoughts on... Well, you know, part of it is context, right? And yeah. we need to figure out, like, okay, this is this part of a much larger forest block? Is this adjacent to larger, even larger still forest blocks like Andrew's is? But another part of it is, is field work. And yeah. just like the, the consultants that have told us a lot more about what's going on on the ground here at Andrew's, uh, you, you still need that. You need yeah. that micro scale of yeah. what's actually on the ground. Yeah. So you can plan those, uh, uh, so you can plan those appropriate uses. You know, what's an yeah. appropriate scale of human use in this place yeah. versus that place? Right. And you need both of those scales of information to, to really plan out a town forest. Yes. And so the hope is that we can continue to get people out on the land in all kinds of different ways because we want people to enjoy nature as we've done today and also be um, educated and articulate about it and just feel it. I mean, like we were yeah. talking about, like we started this conversation with standing among hemlocks. Yeah. There's something reverent about that yeah. that people need in their lives. Yeah, I couldn't um, agree more. And, and also it's that balance of not fracturing that landscape but fragmenting it so much that those things are at risk right because we want to conserve the things that we're enjoying when we're out here yeah and if i may be so bold and i'll speak for myself i feel like those are beings too you know and we want to be aware of them absolutely and take care of them yeah, so, yeah, yeah. well said so here's the famous ravine sophie mm, this is a steep one <laughs> it is steep yeah. I think this is as far as I want to go. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I see we're surrounded by hemlocks. Did you notice as we were walking in that the snow is uh, much less deep? Yeah, they, they really reduce the snow load or, uh, you know, carry a high snow load. So it makes it a lot easier. Uh, I, I'm sure by the end of this week, after we get more snow, it'll be crisscrossed with trails through here. I'm sure the deer will want to move in and... Uh, be putting down trails in here instead of out where the snow is deeper. So they would sleep under these hemlock trees and get some protection from the boughs, you know, from having heat radiate out. It's yeah. a little warmer, a yep. little less windy, a little less snowy, so just all around attractive yeah, good, habitat. Good cover too. Yeah, yeah, and they will feed on hemlock. It's it's maybe not their first choice of food, but uh, if there's uh, greenery that's low enough for them as well. Yeah. Well, just to close on this hemlock forest, this is a natural community type currently in wetland, woodland, and wildlands. And there are other patches of it throughout uh, Andrews Community Forest. And they do provide a, a different kind of habitat than the dry oak forest that we were in before. Um, so, again, just more of that patchy diversity. Maybe they're mm -hmm. here because they're very shade tolerant. We're on sort of the northeastern edge of this ravine mm -hmm. and they do well here so yeah it's probably part of what's going on yeah no i imagine this being a really attractive area for wildlife because you've got food you've got Up cover yeah, yeah exactly yeah, just this here. yeah the yeah. variety is really yeah, really good it is yeah come on over i found something fun over here okay let's see what what you think <laughs> Color I saw. <laughs> 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 oh, so, oh, 
Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this Vermont Master Naturalist hike. And We found so much sign of wildlife. It was really nice. Huh? I was thinking after that fresh snow, it might be hard to yep. see things. But that's yep. I love that about winter that you go out and you really notice what the animals are doing. Right. And we took our time, of course, of and, you yeah. know, spotted things. And yeah. It was, it was so really I'm going to put nice. you on the spot. Favorite animal. Oh. Um, and it, does it, okay, hold on. Can it be, <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, a lynx is my favorite. Oh, yeah. So a little further north, but still in Vermont. further north, but could yes, be a, a porcupine. I mean, oh, they're just, they're fun. Saw, okay, I, It just makes me really happy. They are fun. They are fun. <laughs> I, like, I like the tracks, I like the sign, and, and I like the possibility of seeing them. <laughs> yes, and you do sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? Current favorite is skunk. Really? Yeah. Nice. I mean, there's, on there's some skunks hanging out <laughs> under my porch. It's, you know, it's, it's not just about skunk in the abstract. It's the individual skunks that are my neighbors. Yeah. For, well, in that respect, also for me, I spent the spring watching gray fox kits grow up oh. in Burlington. Oh. And just on a, in a rocky park near my home. And they oh, were just adorable. So nice. <laughs> they're so awesome. cute. So it's the ones you know yeah. sometimes. Yeah. The ones you know. Absolutely. Yeah, great, I would love great to see that. I love great thoughts. Well, join us next time and we'll mm -hmm. have another adventure. <laughs>